when we look at social change, we see that a committed minority of people can shift the majorities. So don't waste time on people who don't believe in climate change, who just don't want to engage at all. Don't waste time there. Focus your time on the people who are concerned, but they don't know how concerned to be, and the people who want to change, but they don't know what to change. Our speaker today is Paul Behrens, author of the thought-provoking popular science book, the best of times, the worst of times, futures from the frontiers of climate science. And he's associate professor of environmental change from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Paul was one of the first to measure the enormous climate benefits of shifting towards plant-rich diets. His pioneering analysis of the impact of dietary, dietary change on global emissions made headline news and led him to, to being named as one of the first Frontiers Planet Prize international champions in 2023, among many other distinctions. He is an expert in energy, in food, and economic systems, and his research examines the transformational changes we can all make to avert climate change and increase our resilience to its impacts. Today, Paul will explore the rapid transitions that are necessary to ensure we can move toward a happier, healthier future. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I want to start off uh, by looking at where we're heading. And it's a obviously very scary picture. We are uh, rapidly moving towards uh, tip points at which we can't recover. Um, it's really important to note that climate scientists have done an excellent job in estimating the amount of warming we would expect for the amount of greenhouse gases in the, in, in the atmosphere. So from that perspective, uh, it's been very accurate uh, from the models. But perhaps what's really important from that is the impacts those temperatures have on human societies around the world, on our water provisioning systems, on our food systems, um, from wildfires to floods to droughts. These different extreme weather events are actually at the higher end of what climate scientists thought were possible. And this last year is another jump in the in extreme warming that we're experiencing and also the large scale changes to the planet to ice sheets, uh, forest dieback and more. And I just want to show this uh, schematically uh, through a plot that uh, Philip Marbet helped me with. Um, and here we show the burning embers from IPCC reports throughout time. So from the IPCC report, the third assessment report in 2001 through to 2022. And what we see here are the different risks at different temperatures for different impacts that we might experience. On the left here, we've got the aggregate impacts to ecology and to economics, to the large scale macroeconomic systems, to the e ecological systems around the world. And what we see here is the impacts that we thought would hit us at just over three degrees in 2001 are now below two degrees by 2022. And the same story is there for large scale discontinuities. These are the large scale uh, ice melting, the uh, forest dieback, so ocean circulations. And here, what we thought would happen at above five degrees is now below two degrees. And so there's been this systemic underestimation of how fast the systems around us could change due to the increasing temperatures. And remember that these are the systems that really matter to us. You know, these are the systems that provide us our food and our water and, our, and keep our infrastructure safe. And so you might be thinking, how, how has this happened? How, how have we systemically underestimated this, this trend? Well, I just want to take one example, and there's, there's lots of examples around the world, but what, one example from boreal forests. These are the forests in Canada uh, and Siberia. Obviously, in Canada, we've seen large-scale uh, wildfires this year. And I just want to show you one example here, because as the world has warmed, the pine bark beetles and pests have moved further north through those forests. They've been eating through the trees, and now we have lots of dead trees in their wake. This is fuel for the fires. And as the world has warmed, we've also seen lightning strikes move further north. So we've both got the fuel and the ignition source moving further north into this dense, carbon-rich uh, boreal forest. And what we can see here is it's, it's a mix of ecology, meteorology, climatology. It's a mix of many different fields, which are incredibly difficult to model as a whole. One, one area that I, I'm very concerned about are our global food systems. 
So our global food systems can be impacted by these extreme weather events as well, from floods, uh, from drought, and there's only so much resilience in that system. Um, and the chance that multiple areas where we grow the majority of our food get hit by extreme weather events each year goes up as the world warms, as we put more energy into the atmosphere, more precipitation uh, into, the, into the atmosphere. And what the studies are showing is that as we increase the temperatures, this chance of a multi bread basket failure where multiple extreme weather events hit these bread baskets around the world within the same year and potentially even multiple extreme weather events in, in one location through the year goes up. So to take one example, uh, maize, which is, is corn, which is the most uh, sensitive crop, studies have found that the chance of a multi bread basket failure in maize before climate change, uh, so last century, would be once in every 16 years, because we'd expect some variation and some uh, bad years where we see reductions of at least 10% in yield. Um, that goes up to once every three years for 1.5 degrees, and once every two years at two degrees. And we say we see similar trends with other crops. And the most important part of this here is that the biggest jump is between pre-climate change statistics to 1.5 degrees. We see this big jump. And so this 1.5 degrees, this is unfolding in the next few decades, well, in the next decade or so. And so one of the big concerns that I have is the chance of large scale food crises and food increases in food price uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. And what the way I like to think about this in terms of what are the impacts on uh, society is through thinking about cost of living. So as we know, I mean, cost of living goes up and down and there's variations in that cost of living. In fact, a lot of that variation is driven by our current polluting systems, things like energy systems and, and, and food systems. So as energy prices go up, cost of living goes up, we have lots of macroeconomic impacts uh, and people feel the pinch. What climate change does is it adds another stress on top of those, those already uh, stressful trends. So if we look at a baseline, for example, as we start to increase uh, the cost of living through uh, climate impacts, we see the, the prevalence of strikes, we see food riots, uh, and we can see, even see political instability driven by this food riot. So, and we saw that uh, through the 2007-2008 food crisis uh, around the world, that that drove political instability. And this is the really sort of the, the, the big scale stuff that scientists are thinking about uh, when we're thinking about uh, civilizational pressures, you know, the, the, these so-called collapse scenarios where things get so stressful and so difficult uh, that it's difficult to keep uh, political uh, stability. Now, I would have, that's that's sort of the picture of where we're going, and this is this is the need for the rapid transitions that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So, that that's the very sort of pessimistic uh, view of things. Now, there are many many things that we can do to avoid uh, these really terrible catastrophic scenarios. Uh, one thing that I really want to point out is that global emission projections have actually lowered uh, compared to where we thought they might might go. Um, this is work that we did to project uh, emissions forwards based on current efforts, so insufficient, uh, woefully insufficient at the moment, but based on current efforts. And we can see that the efforts that have been made have meant that we've avoided the very worst case scenarios. And in fact, you know, moving more closer and closer towards that two degree threshold. But as I've already mentioned, middle of the road scenarios are now a disaster. We've systemically underestimated how bad things could get, even at 1.5 degrees. And so this 1.5 degree trajectory is really non-negotiable now if we're going to avoid uh, large scale suffering in the future. Arguably, we're already starting to see these impacts around the world. And when we see the wildfires in Canada this year, of course, the prolonged drought in Africa, uh, Italy, uh, many other areas of the world being hit hard by climate extremes uh, this year. So it, it's really late in the day. We really need to get closer to that 1.5 degree trajectory. And, and so what really needs to change are the fundamental building blocks of our energy and our food systems, uh, because these drive well over 90% of the climate impacts uh, and also the large scale planetary boundary, the other large planetary boundaries like biodiversity loss, um, uh, nutrient um, nu nutrient imbalances which kill uh, wildlife in the marine uh, systems, 
Um, land use change, deforestation, food is the largest driver of many of these uh, planetary boundaries. So we need these very, very rapid transitions specifically in these two areas. And I wanna talk about what these rapid transitions look like uh, now and move on to that. So if we look at the energy transition, coal and oil, the price of coal and oil has basically stayed around stay the same for many, many years now. In fact, the price for oil is now going up um, at, with the conflict in Ukraine. And fortunately, what we've seen is a massive reduction in wind and solar. It is now cheaper in the world, in the world to install new wind and solar than to continue operating existing oil and gas in many, many regions of the world. So that's an, a remarkable change from just 10 years ago and a, a change that we never thought uh, could happen. Everybody's been shocked by this development. And when we look at the energy system as a whole, we can see that the largest percentage of it, well over 70% of it, is easy to, quote, easy to decarbonize. These are areas that we can use renewables uh, with some storage to decarbonize quickly and easily. There are some hard to decarbonize areas in the orange here. So things like iron, steel and cement and long distance transport. We do have technologies for these areas, but they're very, very expensive at the moment and they need to come down in cost, just like we've seen for wind and for solar. And something I often hear about is, well, what about the materials? Do we have the materials for this energy transition? Uh, it's going to require lots of these different types of materials, um, and we're going to have to mine them in different places. Do, do we have the materials? And that, isn't that going to mean more mining? Well, work that we had out a couple of weeks ago now uh, showed that actually mining decreases, overall mining decreases in the future due to the energy transition. And this is because we mine so much coal today and so many other fossil fuels today that as we roll out the energy transition, the total amount of material moved in this mining transition uh, actually goes down. And so what we see here is this big expansion of batteries, wind power, solar PV, other technologies like transition and this dwindling of coal into the future. And we see total mining activity going down. Now, if we are able to do a circular economy and substantially improve the recycling of many of these uh, core technologies, we can keep those materials in the system. It's a, a value, an asset in the system. Rather than extracting fossil fuels, bringing them to power plants or to cars or to transport, burning them, and then letting all of that material just go up into the atmosphere. It's a, it's a value in society rather than something that we're currently pumping into the atmosphere. This will mean that we will be mining in different places, of course, and I don't want to brush over the very real conflicts that will come from mining in, in these different regions. I just want to right size what this looks like. And if we're able to do a fully circular uh, transition and we're able to sort of rethink our energy systems and maybe move away from this idea of lots of private ownership of, say, electric vehicles, we could make this even smaller. This uh, situation here is for a scenario where many, many people have uh, electric vehicles, etc. It's not necessarily a future I'd like to see, but it's like a worst case scenario for the amount of mining that we might see. We also underestimate the speed of the energy transition. Here are a number of projections from the International Energy Agency in blue, and it, the starting point for each of those lines is when that projection was made. And we can see what the actual installations were in the red line. Uh, so, for example, in 2017, it was thought that by 2040, we'd have about 100 gigawatts of solar installed. Well, that, that was beaten in 2019, uh, and so many decades ahead of what the IEA thought was possible. The transition is also cheaper than we think. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty, which is why we see these curves, these broad curves here, uh, because of the assumptions that you might use, what technologies that you, you model into the future. But broadly, it appears that the transition, the energy transition is cheaper if it's faster. So one study, for example, found that we would save about $12 trillion if we had a faster transition uh, to net zero. As Fred just mentioned, 
the food system on its own is enough to push us beyond 1.5 degrees. So even if we have this huge decarbonization of the energy system, the food system on its own, those emissions from fertilizer, uh, from cow burps, uh, from manure management, those emissions are, uh, and land use change, those emissions alone are enough to push us beyond uh, 1.5 degrees and perhaps even two degrees. So we need a large scale food transition too. And this food transition is made up of three main pillars. Dietary change, so a shift to plant-based diets, reduce the reduction in food waste, and an improvement in the production of food. But when we look at the different opportunities here, so, so how much can these, uh, these different interventions reduce the emissions by, we find that they're not created equal. Here we've got the total amount of emissions as in under business as usual on the left-hand side of this figure. And so we can see this is the tallest uh, bar. And then we can see the different interventions as we go along the x-axis right on the figure. So plant-rich diets, healthy calories, high yields, et cetera. And we can see that plant-rich diets hold the biggest opportunity. And the reason is, is because animal agriculture is just so incredibly inefficient. We're only converting between eight, you know, uh, between three and 17% of the calories. So we're throwing, throwing away uh, 83 to 97% of the calories when we feed uh, animals. They also take up a huge amount of space. And this is critically important in high income nations when other, where other diets are available. Uh, so where other plant-based alternatives are available for us. But this is not the end of the story because animal agriculture takes up so much land. It takes up 80% of all agricultural land. If we're able to save that land, and draw down emissions onto the, uh, draw, so rewild on that land and draw down emissions onto that land, we will be able to double the benefits. And that's work that we did earlier this year to look at where we would save that land from a dietary transition and how much CO2 we would then draw down to that land uh, if it was rewilded. So it, it can become a, a carbon sink. And I like to think uh, visually and, and see what this looks like. And this would be a change from pastures, uh, which are very low in biodiversity, very low in floodwater retention, in carbon retention, compared to a rewilding project like the Neth Estate in the UK. Just look at the variety, the biodiversity of flora and fauna, uh, the carbon sequestration, the flood retention uh, in that picture. And, and that's a picture that we can really harness, especially in high income nations as we shift towards uh, plant based diets. So the question then becomes, if we've got these options available to us and they're so much better for us and they're more resilient, I mean, to, just to take in, for example, the idea of saving that land and drawing down carbon on that land, and then we have better floodwater retention, better drought uh, resilience, a whole number of other factors, higher biodiversity. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we going faster towards these transitions? Um, I'd like to sort of split this into subsidies, vested interests, uh, and greenwashing. And just to take one example here of Shell, uh, Shell in invested 18.3 billion in 2021. So these are just investments alone into uh, different activities in their business. And we can see a small proportion of this, uh, about 10%, according to Shell, was green. When we reclassify this, by the EU classifications, we see that the impact, then the amount of investment is actually around 3%. And that 3% uh, is going towards wind and solar, hydrogen and biofuels, nature, carbon capture, and storage. Now, wind and solar are the biggest deal here, uh, especially for the energy transition I've just been talking about. There is a role for hydrogen and biofuels, but it's much, much smaller than people think. Um, and we can see that wind and solar, which is perhaps the, the most fundamental and, and most rapid mitigation of emissions that we can make, are perhaps 1% of, of the total. And this is, is, is in stark contradiction to what you see all over the internet, where you see the wind turbines, you see the uh, electric car chargers from Shell constantly feeding us this idea that actually some large proportion of this 18.3 billion is going in to renewables. And we see that again and again across uh, fossil industries and large emitting industries. We also see this in agriculture. So we see how companies and big ag in the US are trying to 
push the idea of climate friendly beef and and this is beef that might have a slightly lower emissions but is still hugely more emitting than any other option out there um it, it essentially there is no such thing as climate friendly beef and this label is largely made up and pushed by industrial interests we also see this issue in um in of subsidies in agriculture and for the eu common agricultural sub uh, subsidy for example we see that 80 percent of all subsidies are going towards animal agriculture, either to feed that is then fed to animals or the animals themselves. The other factor of this that I'd really want to highlight is the role of inequality in this. Um, it's very difficult to have large scale change when the people who aren't experiencing those really large impacts from climate change uh, aren't able to uh, make it make a difference uh, make a change to to policy so on the left here we have the footprints of different income groups uh, around the world from the bottom 50 percent to the top one percent going up to over 100 tons per person per year in the top one percent uh, of the population and what i've done on the right hand side here is i've shown how a reduction in these emissions would bring down the overall trajectory for future uh, emissions into the future. Okay, so if I just play this forwards, we can see that as the uh, emissions of the top 1% come down, we see this trajectory for total global emissions coming down. And now as we reduce the top 10% towards the average EU footprint, we're suddenly getting closer to 1.5 degrees. Now, this estimate for the footprint of the top 1% does include some investments as well, so this is a very rough uh, picture, but I think it's instructive to show us exactly how much of a change uh, we can have through changing these uh, footprints. The other point that I really want to highlight here is that while there are some interests pushing back on these transitions that we really want to see, we also underestimate the, how our neighbours feel about climate change, how they feel about transitions and how enthusiastic they are about adopting these changes. So, for example, in the UK, uh, 108 people were asked from around the country uh, in a citizens assembly, what would you like to do to address climate change? Uh, and after several weeks, they came up with several suggestions. They said, we would like to tax frequent flyers. We would like to get rid of SUVs. We would like to cut down on meat. This is far beyond what any politician is currently talking. And when we see the uh, surveys of people from around the world and we ask them, how much do you think people are worried about climate change, for example, they think that it's far lower than the actual level at which people are concerned. So if, if people in the US, for example, uh, thought that about 45% of people would be worried about climate change, the actual level was much higher at around 60 to 70%. And so now we're starting to see the situation where we see good feedbacks everywhere. Uh, we've seen the lowering of costs of wind and of solar. And the faster these investments are pouring in, the faster these costs are coming down, and the faster these better technologies outcompete uh, the old technologies. We also see these feedbacks in society. So the faster we make small steps, the further steps become easier and the faster change becomes. So as we start to eat more plant-based diets, we have more plant-based options on the menu and even meat eaters eat them because they sound good. In civil action, we see more lawsuits and more actions, which means that we have discovery of documents which could be used in even further lawsuits and more comfort with protest. And we can see faster change across society as well. A lot of people are often wondering, what's the biggest thing we can do as individuals? And there's this huge and I think very unproductive debate about individual change and systemic change. These two things are interconnected and we need both system change and individual change. And system change often comes about from changes across lots of individuals. And so my advice is not to sweat the small stuff. Five choices you can make make a huge impact to climate and biodiversity problems, solving 60 to 70% of the problem. And these five things, if we look at them, it's going renewable, wind and solar, buying uh, wind and solar energy if you aren't able to put solar panels up, electrifying as much of your life as possible, and this includes taking fewer flights and going on trains, it includes heat pumps, it includes electric transport, 
Go plant-based, as I say, perhaps this is the single biggest, easiest thing to do uh, to, in order to avoid uh, large-scale uh, climate catastrophe. But also, in a, in a, as an individual, get engaged with groups. Uh, it's often easier if we work together and get talking to one another about climate change and talk about the things that you've done and how they feel, uh, both the good and the bad. Don't be purist, you know, take steps and then see, and then take another step when that feels good. Climate con conversations and social contagion, that equals the system change that I'm talking about. And just encourage others to get involved. This could be a really exciting future, even if we have increasing climate impacts, because the ch things that we need to change will be better for our societies, make us more resilient, make us more healthy, reduce air pollution, water pollution, so many things in our environment. So I'd just like to finish up by talking a little bit about communication at this unique time in history. And, and I think it's really important to be honest about the problems that we face, because they are scary. Uh, and that is that does mean being alarmed. Uh, but we have such amazing solutions. Imagine if we didn't have wind and solar right now. Imagine if we didn't know exactly uh, where we needed to go with, with the energy and the food transitions that we need. And then act on those solutions yourself. And, and it's action that then builds the hope. And, you know, as the IPCC says, every action matters, every bit of warming matters, every year matters, and every choice matters. And as I say, you know, we would be wanting to do these things even if we didn't face climate change. Climate change just means that we need to do these things even faster, these energy and food transitions and economic transitions. We need to do them even faster. And so there's an awful lot to, to cover and there's an awful lot to, to discuss because climate change is an everything problem and it covers so many things uh, across our societies. And um, I, I wrote this book that has paired chapters of pessimism and hope, exactly like this presentation today, uh, in order to explore these, 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 uh, these issues. Thank you very much. I'm just going to wrap up here and move on to the next part of the session. So now we're going to, to meet the scientists and policy experts involved in our panel discussion, and I'm delighted to introduce the first of our three expert contributors. Emily Schuckberg is Professor of en Environmental Data Science at the University of Cambridge in the UK. She is Director of Cambridge Zero, which works to maximize the university's contribution towards achieving a resilient and sustainable zero carbon world. Emily has advised the UK government on climate in various capacities, and in 2016, she was awarded an Order of the British Empire for services to for services to science and public communications. Welcome, Emily. In, in his talk, uh, Paul has highlighted the need for rapid transitions across the global economy, transitions that are driven by the attempt to attain constructive tipping points in technology and society. Reflecting on Paul's talk, how do you see interdisciplinary collaboration as the keyword across academia, industry, and government, supporting this and accelerating our path to a sustainable future in, in, in terms of being able to work towards equitable transitions in food, land use, and energy. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Paul, for that um, presentation. He said at the end there that it was a story of pessimism and hope. And I think very much it is, you know, that, would, that came through very clearly in, in what he said. And it very much, um, resonated with um, the IPC sixth assessment report that came out earlier this year. The summary, one of the summary statements from that was that um, there's a rapidly closing window of opportunity, there's the hope bit, a window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And uh, so I come from the University of Cambridge and uh, the focus of much of the work across the university is really on that, that twin aspect of, you know, how do we do the most we can to avoid those destructive tipping points of concern that Paul highlighted in the start of his presentation and to do so by unleashing the constructive tipping points that are necessary in terms of the very dramatic changes in technology and society, um, some of which there are glimmers of um, of hope around, and, and Paul outlined some of those in terms of uh, the transition that's already away, underway very clearly in terms of our energy sector. So I thought what I'd do is I'd highlight just a few of the conclusions that I've come to through the work that we've been conducting at the University of Cambridge in terms of 
what is necessary to speed our path to a sustainable future. And there are really three key elements that, that I found that are consistent um, associated with that. And those are holistic thinking, accelerated innovation, and radical collaboration. And if I just say a little bit um, about each of those, I mean, in terms of holistic thinking, um, a starting point for much of the work that we've been undertaking has been really understanding who the stakeholders are, broadly defined, associated with a particular challenge, what their needs are, what their interests are, and how targeted solutions can be designed that are um, relevant to those stakeholders, but critically embed fairness. Um, as part of doing that, you can identify what the root causes of a challenge are, what the interdependencies are, what the cascading impacts are, critically what the co-benefits are, especially in terms of human health and well-being, and the melding of expertise across science and technology and arts and humanities really helps to provide solutions that are robust um, to uh, both the challenges and the opportunities um, that might be provided in the future. And just a, one example of where we've been actually undertaking that sort of holistic analysis, um, very much refers to one of the examples that Paul gave him in his presentation about looking at alternative land use, um, where we've been um, bringing together multidisciplinary expertise to look at how land can be managed differently for the benefit of climate and nature and the people who live and work in those um, landscapes. Paul noted in his presentation um, uh, that good feedbacks abound and accelerating innovation um, really critically depends on tapping into those good feedbacks. So research and development loops into new knowledge generation and further discoveries. Um, a learning by doing loops into um, improvements in production, economies of scale loops into cost reductions, and uh, you can start to get these um, virtuous circles um, occurring. Uh, it's very important when you're looking at innovation to understand the unique characteristics of green innovation, that it is urgent, that it is mission oriented. And then if you're looking at how to help support that, you need to understand how to support that type of innovation. And that includes things such as matchmaking between innovators and adopters. It includes things like looking at at innovative policy support mechanisms that help shape markets. It looks at how to bring in finance that understands the characteristics of green innovation in terms of risk and returns. And then if I turn to the final um, element of my kind of triumvirate of, of, of uh, key elements to support that rapid pathway to a sustainable future of radical collaboration, it very much follows on from that holistic whole systems view in the context of the landscape regeneration that we've been looking at, it means bringing together not just academic researchers, but the farming community, conservation groups, community projects, public health agencies, education establishments, business industry, policy makers at a national, uh, local and international um, level all together, uh, just as we know in an academic context that very many times research advances happen when disciplinary boundaries collide. So too, when you bring together those diverse communities, you generate a rich environment, not only where you're able to foster greater goodwill and understanding between those different communities, but where you really unlock human ingenuity and creativity to look for solutions that are effective and resilient. Um, so it's those three elements that I think really uh, we should be looking at how we can bring together to help accelerate that pathway to a more sustainable future. So Paul, do you have any uh, uh, thoughts on, on some of the comments that uh, Emily has just, uh, has just given us? No, I mean, just said it all. I mean, this uh, this tapping into the virtuous circles, cycles, I think is really, really important. And I think there's a lot of science that still needs to be done to understand where those leverage points are. It might be sort of the really counterintuitive things that make a large scale difference. And, you know, looking back through history, it's often it's often value based judgments that make us transition even faster. So, for example, the German uh, the, the the German decision to uh, support renewables, for example, through the energy vendor wasn't necessarily a climate target. It was actually a value to get off nuclear. Uh, and actually, by doing so, they made solar uh, cheap for the rest of the world. 
uh, you know and so these there's these mm -hmm. underestimated sort of leverage points these values that uh, come into uh, radical collaboration uh, that are really really meaningful so we're going to move now on to our uh, our next of the three expert contributors professor peter newell is co-founder and research director of the rapid transition alliance a network of international organizations engaged in practical work research and campaigning to tackle the climate emergency Peter is professor of international relations at the University of Sussex in the UK, and his, recent work, his recent work is focused on the political economy of low carbon energy transitions. He works extensively with NGOs, government, and business. So welcome, Peter. Uh, Paul argued that energy transitions are now unstoppable and that societies can now change faster than we think. So Peter, as a political scientist, how do you see power, how do you see the powerful incumbents, the actors such as Shell that, uh, that that Paul mentioned, impeding this transition away from fossil fuels, and what political strategies can address this issue? And, uh, and would you agree that societies can change and adapt at a pace required to support these successful transitions? Thanks very much. Yes, I would agree with many of those things. Uh, but let me firstly thank Paul for providing such an excellent overview of, of where we're at in terms of climate science, the scale of the challenge we face, and of course, critically, in terms of this conversation, some insights on, on openings for change. And it's really that what is the area where I want to focus my contribution is thinking more critically and more politically, perhaps about theories of change. Um, and particularly as they relate to, to energy transitions, I'll just sort of focus in on that. So, you know, Paul has argued and made the case very convincingly that energy transitions are now unstoppable and that it's a, you know, it's a matter of time, although it's time, of course, that we don't have. And so clearly there's this need for acceleration and there's significant momentum behind the adoption of renewable energy and falling costs of solar in particular, which he's um, highlighted. I guess the problem, though, is that most renewable energy at the moment is is additive. It's not yet displacing the fossil fuels that are, are responsible, as we know, for 75% of greenhouse gas emissions and 90% of, of CO2 alone. Therefore, for, for me, and this is something I'm working on at the moment, we still need these deliberate controls and limits on the production of, of fossil fuels. And we need planned and just transitions. We need phase outs, in other words, of, of fossil fuels, obviously done fairly across the world with sequencing of, of commitments. But there's this growing momentum behind what I would call supply side climate policies to try and fairly leave fossil fuels in the ground. And we're seeing this through things like the Powering Past Coal Alliance, uh, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance that was um, launched at the Glasgow Summit, and ambitious moves by countries as diverse as Denmark and Costa Rica, and then more recently, Colombia and Ecuador to to forego certain reserves of fossil fuels and leave them in the ground in the interest of, of addressing uh, the climate challenge. But clearly, we need to go beyond these these first movers, if you like, to try and target major fossil fuel producing um, economies. So I guess as a, as a political scientist or an international relations person, I would say that despite the momentum that Paul has described, which I think is hugely important, energy transitions, to come back to your question, Fred, are being actively blocked by very powerful actors that still make huge amounts of money from fossil fuels. And they've adopted tactics, as we know, over decades now that have lost us invaluable years in the, in the battle against climate change, um, from climate denialism early on to exaggeration about the costs of action to the production of fake news front groups lobbying all intended to do precisely the opposite of the things emily was just describing right they're actively trying to slow deliberate uh, uh, innovations to try and frustrate collaborations to to slow the pace of change as much as possible uh, so that they're the very last actor standing uh, extracting the very last barrel of oil and that's why i think and i've written a book about this called power shift we need to to shift relations of power we need to transform politics and the fossil fueled politics which underpin uh, underpins this and for me that means dealing with questions of donations to political parties or the revolving doors between government and business the secondments the directorships the the privileged institutional access that many of these powerful actors still have which is being used to deliberately slow down uh, the pace of transition so that's my first point so my second point, and I definitely agree with Paul here, that societies can change faster than we we think and that we can do more than is often um, held to be true. Um, I think we need to be a little bit clearer, uh, and I'll say this as a social scientist, about who who is the we that we're talking about here uh, when we say that we can do more um, and that we don't fall into the trap of saying 
that we're all in this to, to, together, that there's a collective responsibility on consumers and people as a whole uh, to act. I think we need to be a bit more clear and specific about uh, the different agency and levels of responsibility that actors have. And I'm thinking really of some work we did a couple of years ago on scaling behaviour change, it came out as a book called Changing Our Ways. And we talked about what's sometimes referred to as the polluter elite. Okay, so this is this is the the richest 1% um, whose carbon emissions, as, as one of Paul's graphics there showed, I think, are more than the entire bottom half of the population. This was the work done by Tim Gore and co at Oxfam. And, and, and what flows from that then is the need for different policy strategies. So for the for the bulk of citizens around the world who don't have huge amounts of control over how they heat their homes or how they get to work, it's about enabling infrastructures, you know, affordable public transport, insulation of homes and things like that. But it does also mean making some tough choices about how we rein in the overconsumption of, of richer actors, whether that's wealth taxes or frequent flyer levies, uh, meat taxes, whatever it might be, um, because we need to sort of connect these things, you know, supporting poorer populations while reining in um, the, the ability of, of wealthier actors to blow carbon budgets, um, frankly. Um, and it's also, you know, thinking about history and all of this, there are some very powerful historical examples about um, what sorts of change might and might not be possible. And scholars of energy transition, people like Vaclav Smil, are often very sceptical about the sorts of scenarios that we're talking about today, saying that actually energy transitions take decades or centuries. And so the question for us, in a way, is, is how do we speed it up? Because clearly, with the energy transition we're already seeing unfolding, it cannot be left to the market in the way it has been in the past. It's not just going to be about the natural laws of supply and demand. We have to, to accelerate this and force this uh, and make sure that it unfolds in a more socially just way so that those who've contributed least to the problem of climate change don't now face a double burden of being, you know, bearing the, the largest costs in transitioning away uh, from fossil fuels. Um, but for me, it's about saying those historical examples are useful, but they shouldn't limit our imagination about what's, what's now possible because we are in very different circumstances. Um, and that's really what we try to do with the um, rapid transition and our alliance that, that Fred mentioned that I'm part of. We generate what we call evidence-based hope. <laughs> uh, this is evidence about the possibility of change through reference to historical examples, but also some of the transitions that Paul was talking about unfolding in the world today. Um, and you know, occasionally we get these glimpses of how change can be accelerated and the, and the COVID pandemic as horrific as it was in so many different ways, did illustrate that possibility. You know, suddenly you had vacuum cleaner manufacturers like Dyson switching to producing ventilators almost overnight. You saw big shifts in behaviors around work and travel and food consumption. Huge amounts of money were suddenly mobilized, whereas previously we were told there was no such thing as a, as a magic money tree. And so it gave us glimpses into the, the idea that when the political will is there, things can actually move much faster uh, than we often think. And thirdly, and finally, I mean, I very much welcome the emphasis in the talk on the way people can get involved. I think one of the greatest enemies of change is, is often apathy and feelings of disempowerment or thinking that it's sometimes even too late to affect change, that we're already on a, a runaway course that can't be redirected. And of course, this suits the powerful incumbent actors that I was talking about before very well indeed. Um, and so I think messaging, coming back to Paul's final point, is absolutely crucial here. Building alliances, finding common cause, showing how a sustainable society, you know, as Emily was just saying, can can bring so many other co-benefits um, that, that, you know, can be achieved by accelerating and deepening action. And this is a critical challenge. It can't just be, going back to what Paul was saying, let's move beyond this individual versus system change. Uh, binary because it's clearly both we need both of those things working in in synergy to get the sort of um, virtuous cycles that, that Emily was talking about I think that's absolutely um, vital uh, to, to all of this but for me again you know as a political economist it does mean a bit of a, a reset of the economy it can't just be around you know nudging and shifting patterns and collaboration we do need to rethink the basics of work and production and consumption in the economy um, because at the moment we're just pushing way past planetary boundaries as as we know and and the the pressure for me for that more progressive vision will ultimately have to come uh, from below 
but we always need to keep in mind these multiple leverage points again that language is now was, was brought into the conversation it's it's more helpful for me at least to think in terms of an ecosystem of transformation you know there are things we can do as individuals as part of a household as part of a workplace as part of a community and then a broader society and to constantly think about where those um, leverage points might might lie um, in all of that um, and so just to conclude finally I think you know the crucial first step in a way is allowing ourselves to believe that such change is possible and I think the work that Paul and others are doing is hugely important in that endeavor so thank you very much I'm going to give I'm going to give Paul a sense to uh, a, a, a just a, a chance to react to the uh, to 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 Peter's comments Paul do you have something to add yeah, thanks so much, Peter. Yeah, uh, re really, really important points. Uh, and maybe just just to add for the audience is, is that leadership takes a there is a real role for leadership of higher MIS admitters here, and there is a real role for shaming. Uh, to this point of who we are and and who is the we that has to do most of the uh, the, the the shifting here. And you know, research shows that um, taking these actions individually. Uh, and then sharing this across groups uh, can really improve, uh, really impact people and also uh, increase your credibility uh, as an actor. And so I think if we are to take our research seriously, and it is seriously scary, then we have to act seriously as people who are talking about this, who are, who are, who are doing uh, climate action. And that includes things like uh, reducing or stopping flying. It includes uh, plant-based diets. It includes making our own footprints as small as possible and talking about it. And I think that's how the these sort of cultural changes also uh, move through say the higher emitting groups but that's just only one part of all the great things that peter was saying because there's, there's there's so much to go into there so now it is my pleasure to introduce our third expert contributor for the for this afternoon uh professor nick chater nick is professor of behavioral science at the university of warwick in the uk and his research focuses on on the cognitive and social foundations of rationality and how these can be applied practically to business and public policy. As part of his role on the advisory board of the UK Government Climate Change Committee, he examined how the latest behavioral science research can be used to help reduce the UK's carbon emissions. So, he, so welcome, Nick. Welcome to the, to the presentation this afternoon. Um, and uh, so I'll start by saying we agree that without ex extensive public support, and indeed without some public pressure, rapid transition is unlikely to succeed. So, um, so as you think about the challenges of a food transition, as described by Paul, how do you envision the development of compelling narratives that 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 we can build uh, across the broad coalition of public and political uh, players to overcome the many obstacles discussed today, and uh, and more specifically, how can these narratives ensure the success of large scale social and economic change for achieving net zero? Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Paul, for a fantastic presentation to our two commentators so far, Emily and Peter. That's set things up very well. Um, I want to just add a, a couple of things from the point of view of psychology and behavioral science. Um, a first point is that um, if we're trying to get large, large scale uh, behavioral change, it's going to be crucial that that change is not going against the grain of human nature, as it were. So if, we, if we're trying to impose change that people perceive to be um, unappealing, change that they don't actually feel is appropriate, is too rapid or uh, too radical, then we'll simply get backlash. And we've seen that, of course, very powerfully with um, the Yellow Vest movement in France. And recently there's the um, ultra low emissions um, backlash in the UK. So th there are... So there's great scope for um, for backfiring effects, which we need to be very cautious about. And we need to, just, need to be especially cautious about those because, as Peter was highlighting, there are many powerful um, actors with large PR budgets um, who are going to work quite hard in very indirect and hard to detect ways to encourage that backlash. So we need to be very cautious um, that we don't we don't try to impose changes that are too rapid and too radical. Having said that, I think we actually can make pretty radical changes quite quickly um, where it's clear that the changes are actually going to be better. So as Paul was stressing, um, most of the changes that we might wish to make, and certainly food is an example of this, um, are not actually negative primarily. They're, they're going to lead to a world which we're just going to prefer to live in. So of course, with changing energy supply, we're going to have, I mean, most people have electric cars, 
um, think they're just marvelous and uh, you know, much better than um, the alternative. Um, clearly, a world without large amounts of air pollution, uh, which poly fossil fuels out of the energy mix will, will greatly contribute to, that's clearly a very positive thing. And interestingly, uh, an example which is directly on the topic of food is, um, is that, of course, switching to a plant-based diet primarily will have major health benefits for most of us. So when I was on the UK's Climate Change Committee, uh, there was quite a lot of debate about what our targets should be. Uh, we, and they were pretty modest targets for um, the, uh, the, the, the reduction in, in meat consumption in the UK. And of course, if you have modest targets there, you have to have much more radical targets elsewhere. Um, why were they modest? Well, they were modest because there was a perception that the you know, political reality would simply not support more aggressive targets. Um, now, ironically, um, the health, um, the health, the Department of Health in the UK had itself much more radical targets purely on health grounds. So irrespective of um, shifting away from meat from a climate point of view, there are more aggressive targets uh, in the same government uh, which are actually coming from, from the concerns of health. And I think there, that's an example of uh, the kind of thing we need to be capitalising on, because it's often going to be the case that we want to do things anyway that are better for us, and we need to make the argument where the argument is going to land most effectively. Um, so I think trying to, trying to um, push the dietary change on, to some extent, health grounds is going to be at least as effective. But the other thing, and I think this is perhaps the most important thing for food or anything else, is... Is, is the is, is f focusing on the positive picture so in in paul's excellent book the best of times the worst of times um we need to focus on the best of times as well as the worst of times and of course that's that's the whole point that paul is making but i think it's very very crucial from the point of view of an effective public uh, public debate because we're only going to make progress if we are collectively of the opinion and there will be an exception to this but if we are generally of the opinion that uh, these transitions these transitions will lead to a better world and we all want to be part of it and that we're going to get there anyway so anyone who's blocking or slowing things down or delaying is first of all to be called out and, and not tolerated um and you know, but because this is actually you know endangering endangering our collective future but also that they're essentially dinosaurs who are soon going to be extinct so any business which is trading on uh, high carbon outputs is not going to be around for very long. Um, it needs to be clear to us all that's the way the world is going. So we need to realize there's a positive future. It's coming. It better come quicker rather than sl more slowly, because first of all, that will be cheaper and more economically efficient. But also, of course, the damage to the climate in the meantime, we're not quick, is, is, very, is very severe. Just a final point on, on, on bad actors. I think we do need to be very clear that the public debate and indeed the operation of the market is not operating freely at the moment there are very powerful forces with very large budgets who have gained a great deal by slowing things down we need to stop that we need to need to work very hard on the way lobbying works the way money and politics works um, and these are really fundamental difficult things to shift because of those, those very powerful forces are very ke keen that we don't shift them but as a uh, as democratic societies and societies across the world, we need to work very hard to gain control of our institutions so that we're not being uh, coerced into very dangerous directions and having our, our media discussions and our public debates uh, co-opted by, by powerful forces who really don't want us to succeed in, uh, in, in, in working towards a, a, a carbon transition and a net zero world. Paul, once again, you have a chance to, to give a few comments um, about the, uh, the, 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 the presentation of Nick. Yeah, th thanks, Nick. Uh, again, just like really important points. And uh, this this point about being in the room, I mean, the Climate Change Commission has so much uh, of a sort of power instead of setting setting goals and uh, from outside the room. And I don't know whether it's the same thing for you, but um, we're not in the room enough when it comes to what the solutions look like. Uh, you know, when you talk to politicians and they're constantly talking about diversions like carbon capture and storage, uh, hydrogen, uh, biofuels, uh, and, and they're not focusing on the things that we actually, you know, know from scientific consensus what works in the energy transition and, and how to map that out. It's extremely dispiriting. And I think that's where you get then this frustration from young people, uh, especially uh, out on the streets and then people taking direct action. Uh, you know, against the law, and then you then you have this 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 uh, this this um, tension uh, in democracies between you know this democratic reform. How do you get that reform and get that money uh, out of politics? Uh, and it, it's extremely difficult. And uh, I, I mentioned the um, 
the uh, the, the civic uh, civic assembly uh, in the in, in the presentation, and I have a lot of hope that some of those sort of new arrangements for participatory democracy uh, can be really helpful. I mean, on the negative side, they won't listen to, of course, <laughs> um, but on the positive side, they're far beyond where the politicians are at. So if we can just get the the, the general view of the, poli the the public in there more often, then it's already going to be more accelerated more accelerating than leaving it just to the politicians and the lobbyists. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you to to our, to our three panelists for their for their contributions. Um, what we're going to try to do is jump straight into the question and answer session, and and to do this, I'd like to introduce my colleague uh, Gilbert de Gregorio. Gilbert is the head of our uh, partnerships for the Frontiers Planet Prize, and um, and 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 so I'm. It's my pleasure to welcome Gilbert, who will be running the the question and answer part of today's program. Over to you, Gilbert. Thank you, Fred. Um, I'm really pleased to be moderating this session. It's such an important, if what, harrowing discussion. So I'd like to kick off with a question, um, which is on the broad topic of whole systems analysis. So this is um, from Catherine. Um, and uh, we are all aware that the global population is going to surpass 9 million by 2050. And we talked about a great food transition, but we also need to be looking at how we manage our water resources. How can we ensure we have better food security? Should there also be a rapid transition in our global water management framework? Um, that is very much open. I don't know if any of the, the panelists like to kick off or, or Paul, if there's something you have some thoughts on. I've been speaking quite a lot already, but we did do some work on uh, food resilience. <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, again, it comes back down to this uh, concept of uh, plant based transitions, uh, because we are growing so much food that's fit fed to animals. Um, we 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 actually grow enough food today to feed 10 billion. I personally don't think that we'll get to 10 billion uh, due to current uh, trends in demographics. Uh, but uh, this plant-based transition will also improve the resilience. And we had a paper looking at how a plant-based transition in the EU alone would be enough to counteract most of the losses in production from the Ukraine-Russia conflict, for example. So we're talking about huge amounts of food saved in terms of water and food security. And maybe I can just add a little bit in there as well. So, I mean, quite clearly, this whole system analysis, understanding all the interconnectivity, um, you know, the interconnectivity between the response to climate and food security and water security, are, are clearly really critical. And uh, let me give you just one example, though, um, slightly different, but but water is at the heart of it. I mentioned our Centre for Landscape Regeneration and the whole system analysis we've been doing it as part of that. One of the landscapes we've been looking at is um, a heavily farmed peatland landscape emitting large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions currently when it's farmed but actually water in a slightly different way um, than water security is central to the solutions associated with that because one way in which you can limit those um, emissions from the peatlands is to look to um, re-wet those peatland landscapes that is an part of the uh, way in which you reduce those greenhouse gas emissions and then the the challenge is then looking at how you can look to sustain um, the economy Economy, the rural economies in those landscapes, as you are managing that land differently um, and managing cru crucially the water in that land differently. So there are so many different, and this is where it becomes really fascinating, so many different ways in which those interconnections play out and creative solutions can then be identified that work for people and planet. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, very, very clear. So I'd like to kind of steer on to when we're thinking about um, kind of more holistically and, and what we can do as a global citizens. And we know that eco-anxiety is something that has impacted, especially the generation that's going to be inheriting our planet. So I have a question from Jorge, and I've categorized, cat put this under the category of evidence-based hope. So maybe I'd like to, to direct this to, to Nick Chater, please. How do you deal with eco-anxiety and more precisely with the fact of people around you not being concerned or willing to change their habits to adopt what we can do as citizens to enable a net zero economy over the next uh, 10, 20 years? Yeah, this is a very deep and important question. So I think there are two, two factors to, to consider here. So one, I think, is that eco-anxiety as a sort of destructive force in terms of human well-being now is a really serious issue. And it, it probably is causing serious mental health problems for a new generation. And that really concerns me a great deal. And that doesn't help. Right? I mean, just being, you know, being anxious and mentally distressed is not going to solve our problem. Um, I think one of the, the, the solutions to that is is the, um, the 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 vision of what can be done and the fact that we actually, this transition is coming 
Um, it's, it's, it's the question is, are we going to get there fast enough? The transition is coming. There is a and the transition will lead to a better future, um, irrespective actually of the climate. The, the, the things we're going to do are going to make life better for all of us. So I think to the extent that that, that, that the generation who are suffering most of equal anxiety for very good reasons can can have can, can be given and, and given a credible vision that there is actually uh, a, a positive future um, that is attainable then that reduces the sense of hopelessness and sort of despair. Um, having said that, we're still not talking about, you know, we're still, <laughs> there are still really, really serious things to worry about. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that, as Paul was very, very clearly saying. Um, I think the other aspect you highlight is the, the dissonance between one's own personal concern and apparent disregard that the people around one are feeling. Um, and I think there, organizing and uh, is one thing because of course by organizing you're inevitably interacting with all sorts of people who feel the same way you do and helping to propagate the message so that's also empowering but also very powerful because in fact social movements always require this kind of um, spread uh, bottom up across large numbers of people um but i think also we tend to underestimate actually and this is this was highlighted i think in one, one, of, the, one of the presentations uh, we tend to underestimate what other people actually are feeling people are much more anxious than they let on and that they may go about looking uh, unconcerned, and they may even go about driving around in SUVs. They may be terrified underneath. So having some of those discussions with people, whether you think they agree with you or not, you might we might be surprised. I think we often are surprised how much concern there is, and how actually many people are not so averse, or at least in the long term, or even the medium term, may not be averse to making big changes in their lives. Thank you very much. That's uh, really thought provoking um, what you shared there. And I think, you know, we've, I think collectively we understand that uh, uh, ourselves as, as citizens and we understand the needs that we can do on a consumer front can actually make an impact. So I think my final question is, is going to be, let's say, the party that's lagging in, in this race and that, that's the policymakers. So this is a, a final question I'd just like to wrap up uh, for you, um, Peter. We have a question from, from Laura who's very happy. She's great news and projected impacts of the energy transition, that technology is there. And Paul has made it absolutely clear that it's uh, economically viable and it's something that we can deploy. What are the short-term costs involved and the timelines needed from governments to ensure that this is actually embedded into um, uh, national policies? Yeah, I mean, there's clearly a crucial role for government all the way through, um, partly around supporting the forms of you know, innovation that Emily was talking about. You know, there's a lot of discussion of the entrepreneurial state <laughs> that's able to sort of reduce the risks of investing in certain areas, provide positive tax inducement subsidies where necessary. Um, sometimes it's about stopping doing the bad things. Um, for example, the uh, 11 million US dollars per minute still spent on fossil fuel subsidies, for example. <laughs> so there's some some redistribution that knows, needs to go on. Um, but it's also about sending clear, very clear signals to 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 business about you know the pathway for change and the timeframes in which that's going to happen. Um, because ultimately, businesses in the sorts of economies we have at the moment just want to make money. Um, and so it's about giving them a clear framework and what the, what the rules are in a, in a post carbon SDG compliant world. Uh, so, you know, if you want to succeed over the next 10, 20 years, these are the sorts of things you're going to have to do with your business model and, and just really setting that out clearly. Um, but making sure there's sort of short, you know, nearer term targets, the problem with, you know, many businesses having 2050 type targets, net zero ambitions is that they, they can push those onto future uh, CEOs or shareholders and so on. So we need the th a bit like the Climate Committee tries to do in the UK, you need these regular check ins, regular accountability and consequences if you don't meet those targets. And that's really where there is a, a role for governments to, to use carrots and sticks to make sure that we get get on the right direction. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to just ask Emily, do you have any sort of thoughts that you would like to, to share as a panelist before um, we wrap up and we head back over to Fred? Uh, well, actually, you know what? I, the, um, the question about um, eco-anxiety, I, I have a eight and a 10 year old, uh, 10 year old daughters. And my 10 year old said to me just last weekend, having watched uh, the latest David Attenborough documentaries, which you know is, present the amazing wildlife, but also the state of the planet. And she said to me, um, I no, I mommy, I don't see what the point in living is. Um, and she didn't mean it individually, she meant for humanity. What is the point of humanity really when we're doing this to the um to the planet? And so I I really deeply think that for especially for our young people, creating that sense of agency that they can be part of 
the solution, that their voices are listened to and their ideas of how to live life differently, of what our role in on the planet is, is so important. And I actually think that, you know, each of the presentations today have in a way spoken to that, that there is still hope um, that there are ways in which we can tap into human creativity, ingenuity and create that different future. But we need to find ways of uh, structuring society and democracies differently so that we're able to capture um, those ideas and innovations to accelerate them, to look at how they can be implemented fairly and effectively um, so that we can create that better future. I think that's a really great time for us to stop and hand over with very positive and hopeful words. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. Um, so Fred, uh, over back to you. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you for that excellent question and answer session. It was a really a, a, a great contribution to the program today. Um, I just want to point out that there are a few high level takeaway messages that I've been hearing through the discussions. Uh, first of all, rapid transitions are possible in food and energy systems. Uh, the, the, we see the real potential for these transitions to make a real difference. And we've heard about the, our responsibility uh, in our role as individual. It, uh, alongside the role that governments and businesses and institutions play, each and every one of us can indeed contribute to driving systematic change. And we have to work together. We, we talked about collaboration. We have to work together in order to deliver fair transitions, and we need a global approach to support holistic, one of the key words, radical and interdisciplinary collaboration. And finally, for the sake of Emily's daughter, we need, we need hope. A positive narrative is fundamental to drive towards the tipping points that we've been talking about. And public and, and political pressure is, will be crucial in the success of any rapid transformation. So with that, I'm going to just, for the next slide, I'm going to put in a, a plug for uh, the Frontiers Foundation Open Science Charter. So the meeting of, of the, the timing of this meeting today is actually excellent because last week at the Falling Walls meeting in Berlin, we made public this charter for open science, which was written in collaboration with a, a broad partnership. The charter calls upon the scientific community and institutions of research to recognize the urgency of our societal challenges and to fully commit to open access to all scientific publications by the year 2030. It calls for all stakeholders to allocate resources for publication services in a more transparent manner and to move finally to a functional marketplace based on competition for editorial quality and services. By doing so, we will also very significantly restore the public's faith and trust in science. This will be a centerpiece of our action at the COP28 meeting that starts later this month. So please take the time to read it and to support it. And with that, I am just now going to invite Paul to share some final thoughts and con concluding remarks. Um, just Paul, just to sort of fr to, to frame the question, what do you see as the most critical steps that we should be taking in, in the immediate future? I just want to, to follow on from what uh, everybody has been saying about hope. Uh, and you know, and, and and philosophers generally suggest that hope comes from three different things. It's a it's a vision for the future that's better than today, and the changes that we've heard will be better uh, than you know even if we didn't face climate change, for example. Um, the uh, second point is that it has to be a reasonable vision. It has to be a vision that isn't a utopian in any sense. So it's it's going to be an sorry about that. It is going to be an emission. Uh, it is going to be a future that is going to be uh, struggling with climate change. Uh, and the uh, third is some way to work towards it. What is our agency there? What agency do we have towards that? And it's through the acting that we build the hope. We don't just build the hope just willy nilly by putting our feet up on the table uh, and, and wishing for the best. Um, and when we look at what social change, we see that a committed minority of people can shift the major majority. So we see between about 15 to 40 percent of people, that's usually the threshold, uh, can shift majorities. So don't waste time on people who don't believe in climate change, who just don't want to engage at all. Don't waste time there. Waste, focus your time on the people who are concerned, but they don't know how concerned to be, and the people who want to change, but they don't know what to change. Uh, and I think if we can focus there in the very short term, we can make big differences. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, th thanks for your presentations today. 
Um, I, I, my temptation is to give each of our panelists 30 seconds just to, to, to have a, a, a final comment before we close. Em Emily, would you, do, do you have a, just a, a last observation for, for us before we close today's presentations? Yeah, so one of the points that I made was a radical collaboration. And in many senses, I feel like the discussion that we've had today is an example of that. Um, each of us have been bringing different disciplinary viewpoints to the discussion. And it is so important to create forums such as this and to enable that sort of whole system thinking and ra radical collaborations. Thank you very much, Emily. And so let's, let's go over to Peter. Peter, do you have uh, some some final comments? Yeah, I would just encourage everyone because we often have this conversation with students about what they can do and, and others that I work with. And it's really about thinking about your own agency across those different spheres I was talking about, but also not giving yourself too much of a hard time because it can be utterly overwhelming. <laughs> Think about, you know, the resources you have, the agency that you have, the power you have in the different spheres in which you you know operate in your life. Um, but not get overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge. And I think something Nick said was important. My sense of, you know, working with activists a lot is that people just benefit from coming together and getting things done. And they're not always the most, you know, committed climate activists necessarily, but they, they're trying to build something better, a better world out of community and engagement and mutual aid and these sorts of things. And those are often the starting points. Um, so I think we need to be open to different theories of change. Okay, terrific. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. And Nick, uh, over to you for the final word. Well, my uh, final thought is the aspirational nature of the of the world we're trying to create. Um, so we want to be in a, in a world where electric cars are cool, plant-based food is just great and super tasty, and like, why wouldn't you want to eat it? I, I do. Um, and if the, most of the transitions we want to make are great, and we want to be thinking this is the aspirational cool thing to do, not just it's, a, it's, it's, it's something we have to do, it's something that we want to do and we're excited about. Terrific. Thanks, Nick. And I, I just have to say, I can't help but say this has been such an insightful, inspiring, and rich discussion. And it's a shame that we have to uh, end the session, but unfortunately, it's it's time it's time to close it down. We could have gone on for hours with the, the with, with the various themes that, that that emerged from the discussion today. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our speaker, Dr. Paul Barents, as well as professors Emily Schuchberg, Peter Newell, and Nick Chater for their contributions to the discussion today. Their experience and their insights have left us really with a lot to think about as we as as we read about how together as a society we're going to navigate these critical decisions that lie ahead. Uh, it's clear that the choices that we make in these coming years will have a profound impact on the future of the planet, and we are extremely grateful for their guidance in this very, very critical matter. And thanks to everybody who attended today. I hope you all enjoyed the session. So until we gather again for the next forum, we wish you all an excellent end to the year. Take care and looking forward to seeing you here next time.